I would like to welcome up uh, Chris Russell, who is the CEO and President of Tsunami AR. Uh, Chris is here with his team. Um, I have a very, uh, I have a complete belief that AR and VR is going to profoundly change the nature of work, uh, particularly industrial work. But I also believe, I mean, particularly AR for industrial work, but VR has the potential to profoundly change about how we think about learning experiences, how we think about coaching experiences, how we think about um, the, the delivery of, of learning right at that moment of need, the way that Charles was talking about this morning. So uh, over to Chris and, uh, and his team. Thanks very much. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Hello? How's that? No. Yeah. No. How's that? Yeah, it's That's getting better. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. We have a soccer picture up. So, uh, thanks for the invitation today. Uh, again, Chris Russell, Tsunami VR. And if you don't know exactly what that means or why it's related to you, I like to start here. Is usually when people think about VR, they think about wearing one of these, right? Like that. And then what am I doing in here? I'm playing a game usually, or um, sometimes I've got a, a simulation or a training app. And, um, and so I want to dispel a little bit that that's what VR is, because I think what you're going to find maybe after we show a bit of our, our product, that it's not necessarily about wearing a headset, it's not necessarily about wearing a game. It's kind of where the industry started was in what we call weekend VR, where you're playing games and having fun and doing cool stuff. And what we do is Monday through Friday VR, which is for the workplace. Uh, we, ex we deal exclusively with enterprise clients like you know, Boeing and Audi and Lockheed and what have you. And so that's the setting for this VR. But I don't want to lecture about VR. What I want to do is tell a quick little story about my first conversation with Carl. And because uh, he was, uh, we got introduced through a mutual friend and we jumped on the phone to talk for a few minutes. And, um, and Carl said uh, very quickly into the call, he said, uh, my clients are asking me about VR, why? And I said, well, tell me a little bit about what you do and tell me about your customers and then we'll talk about that a little bit. And the, it, it, I jumped quickly to the notion of, well, maybe the reason that they're talking with you is because some of the case studies in VR that have come out over the last year demonstrate that you can achieve on order of magnitude 90% cost savings in training. And if you stop and think about it, it's not, that's not crazy, right? Because in so many training environments, I have to take personnel, take them out of their job, sometimes transport them somewhere else where they can sit and attend a session. And the reality is that that, that session is not very representative of what they really are trying to get trained on. And so the notion in VR is that you could create almost like a simulated environment, or even more, you could simulate environments that don't even exist yet. And then you could eliminate travel. You shorten the time that they're away from their work, and you get the, the, the accountants out and start to put pencil to paper, and you figure out, wow, you could really save 80 to 90 percent, probably, in training in certain selected arenas with, uh, with VR. And um, so I said, maybe that's why they're asking, Carl. And then I said, but that's, I hope you're sitting down, because what, what I want to tell you, and this is my conversation with Carl, I hope he'll attest to it's all real, is I said, it's actually much bigger than that. The nature of work is all about to change. And what it has to do with is the cognitive science of how we learn. And the way that we want to learn, the way that our optical nerve and brain is wired to learn is what we call multidimensional or hyperdimensional. I don't want to go to my laptop, read some instructions, and then come back to the jet aircraft engine and say, OK, now I think, hold it, I forgot. Now let me go back and look here. Each time I'm setting down my tools, right, and I'm coming back to a very complex scenario. And that, that creates a cognitive overload on our brain, all of this shifting between contexts and content. And so the idea is that what we want to do with learning and operations is make it like playing soccer. Because that's what we all want to do at the end of the day. World's most popular sport. Now, why, why do I say like soccer? Because soccer is hyperdimensional. You've got this bouncing ball. You've got your teammates. You've got the opponent. You've got nets. You've got a crowd. You've got a bird flying over. You've got the smell of the turf. And your brain is taking all of that in and processing it. And it's not be, even being stressed. It doesn't create load. 
because we're made to do it that way. And so as we think about moving into this world that we call virtual, what we want to do is emulate how our brain wants to work. And I think it wants to work like soccer, which is hyperdimensional. But then it even wants to be like soccer in the context if it wants to be familiar. Right? It's a round ball, and when it bounces, I can kind of guess which direction it's going to go. That familiarity makes the game fun for everybody. Soccer is collaborative. You have multiple people on your team. You're out there with your buddies. You know, you're teeing off and being physical with opponents. And so that notion of that collaboration is very much about virtual. It's not about being isolated in a headset playing a game by yourself. Virtual is like playing soccer. It's putting, it may or may not involve putting a headset on, and it's doing familiar tasks in collaboration with colleagues. It could be people that you work beside. If you're uh, an automotive designer and you have 5,000 people that work in your design organization, how do, we comp how do we collaborate together around complex objects? Virtual can achieve things that you can't do by waiting to fly people around to get in rooms together. So what we're going to do is spend most of the rest of the time essentially giving you a demo of what, what we call virtual workspaces. It's just a work environment. And what I challenge you is to try to, 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 try to keep it simple and ask yourself, is this workspace that you're seeing are you familiar? Can you imagine it being collaborative? And can you imagine it being fun? Because if we can achieve those simple things but do it in a hyperdimensional way, then what we have the potential to do is help a workforce train and get retrained on products and processes that are growing ever more complex. Because that's the world that we live in, and it's not getting simpler, it's getting even more so. And so that's what we hear from our clients and why they're thrilled about this product, because they view it as an easy way for people not to get trained, but to exchange ideas and exchange ideas in familiar ways on things like whiteboards and be able to look at the car if we're talking about the car and be able to pull it apart and, and look, look at the piece or where, where it keeps breaking and be able to hand it to you and say, hey, could you take this part and go fix it? You know, normal, familiar, collaborative experience. So hopefully I haven't built up the demo, but um, that's what you should be looking for. And if we've achieved nothing else today other than me convince you that VR is not about getting lost in a headset and playing a game, but it's actually about enabling processes even around those that are the most uh, complex in your organization, then we'll have achieved something together here today. And, and then for those of you that would like to dig a bit more into use cases that might be relevant for problems you're tackling, we're going to hang out here and we're going to take this demo environment and we're going to set it up out in the hallway and so you can even play around with it a little bit and talk to some of our folks. So uh, Carl, thanks for the invite and um, hope you enjoyed the, uh, the demo. So I'm going to hand it over to Vince, who are, who's our chief engineer. and. Um, and what he's going to do is take you inside of a workspace and he'll talk you through what you're seeing. And if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and interrupt him because uh, Vince is easy to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, good. You can hear me. Uh, can, you, can we hear Dan as well? Hey, how's it going, Vince? All right, good. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me, say, let me start by saying uh, all the products that we build are multi-platform. You don't have to have a VR headset on. Right now what you're viewing is uh, controlled by gamer controls. So everything that you see me doing here, you can experience inside and uh, be in the world with us no matter where you are. So let me switch into VR mode here. And uh, I just connected the whole world in 20 minutes. So uh, give me a second. All right, so what we're gonna do is uh, I'm going to show you, we've got some more people in here. So here's our user board, you can see on the screen. Uh, Dan and I, well, we've got Dan and Dan because we're both right here connected to the same system. We've got Lauren, who's actually in our office in Encinitas. Hey Lauren, how you doing? He's in blue over there. And then a laptop controller, which is the Razor. So what I'm going to do is walk you through, oh, Dan, you're actually amazing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is walk you through from simple functionality to more complex functionality. 
So if we, if Dan, if you'll join me over here at the whiteboard. When we were setting up, I put on a series of questions on the board here. Dan's going to answer them by using speech to text and also by writing on the board. And while he's answering those questions, I'll show you a little bit of the functionality of this controller. So this controller is kind of your, your central hub here. You've got a palette where you can do all your different colors. You can do shapes that are preloaded by the user, by the customer. And then you've got a file browser here and a function wheel here. So if I go in here to my files and I say EdCast protect your tools, I can pop that right onto the board and then I can go up to it. Maybe I say EdCast, whoops, sorry about that. Back that up. Erase that. <laughs> EdCast <laughs> protects your tools, right? And then, so I can write on that. That's a little messy because I didn't expect it to go that way. But Dan could come along and fix it for me if he wanted to. Dan's going to say, you are a terrible writer. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So we can collaborate on whiteboards. I can snap images on there. Dan went over here and he wrote some answers to my questions. So we've got a robot that I'm going to show you here in a moment. What is the hole made out of? And let's see if I like his answers here. Hold on. What is the fiberglass? What is the hole made out of? Fiberglass. Uh, OK, you get good on that one. What is the maximum depth? 2,000 feet. Let's see. Mm, I think you're wrong on that one. And how heavy is the unit? There's no way that's 1,500 pounds. So I can go in and say the answers to your questions were rejected or approved. And we can instantly collaborate. So that's, uh, now he's crying about it. So that's very simple functionality on a whiteboard. Uh, let's increase our complexity a little bit. Let's go over to the robot that's in question. And I'm going to spawn a whiteboard here, right there. Let's look at a couple pieces here. Dan, I'm going to give you this. First, I'm going to look at this piece. Spin it all around. I can say that I've been in the field with this robot, and I know this manifold gets loose, so I think we need to put some bolt holes in this thing right here. And then I look at it. Put bolt holes here. OK, I don't like that. Easy enough. Bolt holes should go here. So let's see. <laughs> Speech recognition is a little tough sometimes. So let me do this. Bolt. Holes. Right? Bolt holes go here. And I can write on the whiteboard and tell him that, or he, he can put some stickies on there. Sometimes when you're in a big room and it's amplified and that, your speech doesn't work as well as you think it will. Um, but the cool thing is, I reset my object. You can see my notes there to stay in the object. You can see my bolt holes that I drew there. So it's instant mechanical engineering type co uh, collaboration. Now Dan's got the piece and he's looking at it. He might make some edits to it. But what I can do is I'm going to take that from you, Dan. And I can blow this thing apart into all of its pieces instantly. And we can go through it and look inside here. You can see the little fan is running in there and see all the parts. Any of these pieces we can take out and look at. We can write on any of these pieces, make notes. <laughs> whatever we think is important. Dan's making some little notes over there. So this is the first time that we're basically democratizing design. I don't have to know anything about 3D CAD software. I don't have to be an engineer, really, even. I can be a tech out in the field who works on this thing, and I can instantly come back and collaborate and tell the problems that I've seen out in the field. So let's go over to this power inverter here. Hey, ben. Another example. Hey Vince, before you go on, yeah. uh, I really hate the red on this. Can we change the material to uh, something sure. a little cooler looking? Hmm. Yeah, let's do clean metal on this right here. Ah, oh, that looks a lot better. Pull it off. Think of you like that? Yes, thank you. Cool. <laughs> All right, so then if you blow that apart, those two pieces that I colored are still colored. Oh, you proved it, great. Awesome. So let's go over to the inverter, power inverter. So let's say I'm a technician in the field, right? And I, 
I fix whatever contains this power inverter. And I keep having to fix it. It keeps breaking over and over again. And I notice that it's overheating all the time. So I'm a technician. And I can come into this space. Nobody has to be in here with me. It can be just myself. And I say, first of all, I can write on all the surfaces. This always breaks. <laughs> if I'm frustrated, but I can clear that off. And you can write on all the surfaces down like that. Clear it easily. But what's really valuable here is I can take the surface off. And then if I go over here and look, I can look at the airflow going through this machine, through this inverter. And as a, as a simple technician who's not, you know, I'm not a flow engineer. I don't have any, any uh, thing to do with that. There's my flow. I pull that out. I could tell, well, let me show you again. I can tell just by looking at this model that there's really no air over here. No air, sorry, no air right here. Everybody can see that probably on the screen. There's air flowing through the whole machine except right there. So I put that note in here. I can leave the room. I can invite Dan. I can send him an email. I can text him and say, hey, Dan, go into the 148 room. There's an inverter in there. I'm going to show you what I saw in the field. I left a little scribbly note on it. You'll get it when you see it. So Dan comes along. He looks at my work here. He says, oh, you're right. Let's put a fan right there. And we'll increase the airflow on this machine right here. I think that will fix the problem. So instant collaboration there. Uh, let's go to a little bit more complex. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Uh, let's go over to this ATM machine. This ATM machine has 1,000 files in it. It's from NCR. It is a real ATM machine model. Uh, I can stick my head in there. I can see all the parts. I can mark up the parts if I'd like to. Let's change this out. That's interesting. But what's also interesting is that you'll notice that there are a ton of parts to this thing, right? So if I wanted to get to an internal part, I would be taking this thing apart forever, forever, and ever. What I can do is take one of these cutting planes and just stick it right in the machine like that. I could stick it and look all the way through the machine if I wanted to, but I can stick it right in here. And then from inside that cutting plane, I can pull the pieces out that I'm interested in without having to take the whole machine apart. And the same thing, we could collaborate on these pieces, put little sticky notes on them, write on them, maybe a drawer keeps getting stuck, whatever. Or maybe this is a new ATM machine. I'm going to reset it in. Put that thing over there. Maybe this is a new ATM machine, and I want to show Dan how to remove the paper tray. Right? It's a new machine. He doesn't have the manuals yet. So I say, Dan, meet me in room 148. Hi, Dan. I'm going to show you how to place the paper tray here. You take off this back panel. Take off the screen protector, take off the screen, remove the screen casing, remove that bolt right there, and then take the paper tray out. I mean the paper roll. Yeah, that paper roll. And then we put the paper roll back in there and reset the machine. And so literally in, what was that, 20 seconds, I just trained Dan how to, re how to replace the paper roll on this machine. It's really the first time I mean, you don't have to ship this ATM anywhere. Nobody has to have the documentation. You don't have to watch videos on how to do it. We can meet in here and do that. You can do a screen capture, record that thing, and then in 10 seconds, you have a video on how to replace the paper tray, tray there, paper roll there. Um, we've got a couple other things you can do here. This is a standard PowerPoint. You can go through this PowerPoint. I'll back up just a tiny bit for you. Go through this PowerPoint. Dan can make some edits on it, whatever he doesn't like about this PowerPoint. Go to the next slide. What's going on here? Go back to this slide, sure. Got a couple of duplicate slides in there. Okay, and then, but as, you'll see as we go back and forth, all his edits are in the PowerPoint presentation. Without opening PowerPoint, without having to, you know, get out of this application, and he can edit. You can just write something on there too, Dan, not just the shapes. I'll write something on there too. I don't like that model right there. This is wrong. Change the PowerPoint, right? And then what we can do is we can export this board, these notes, and this page will be exported to our local machine. Finished exporting board to, and that's a path on my local machine, so I'll have it here. 
So even someone who doesn't have this application, we can send that file and they'll see our edits. Uh, we've got a video right here. This is a video for the, oh, I should have played this before the ATM, but this is a video for the ATM machine. And I won't waste too much time, just pause it right there. Go ahead and make some edits on the video. Same thing, we don't have to open a video editor. We don't have to be outside this application. Verify that, or maybe we don't like this part, or whatever. And then we stop the video and play it again. And you'll see that when we get to our spots, the editing on the video goes right there and shows up again. It's a frame by frame record. The great thing about this is the collaboration we did on the whiteboards, the collaboration on the PowerPoint, we don't have to write do not erase or take pictures or anything like this because the, somebody feels the pain right there. Uh, because all of these rooms live in the cloud forever, so uh, all of this is available for as long as you want and to whomever you invite into this space. Uh, we've got a live web page here. Um, maybe somebody, Lauren, can you log into the EdCast web page while we show some other um, a little bit more functionality here. Still in. You actually have to log in from yours because of the uh, session control. Oh, okay. So let me save that for later then. Um, let's go over to the car. So here's a model of a car. Dan, if you want to get in the car, that'd be cool. Uh, so things you can do on, on models here. So imagine we're talking about this car. I want to raise the hip line a couple inches. I'm behind my range of my sensors here, I think. Raise the hip line. Wow. Okay, I'm going to move a little bit. I have a small space here, so. What is happening? Sorry, am I making you guys sick out there? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You're fine. All right, good. So, someone's giving me a hard time. Here, Dan, you do it. So sh show me how to raise the hip line on that car two inches. There you go. You can make notes there. Any surface in here we can write on or put images on, change the materials up two inches. What about over the windows? And while he's doing that, I'm going to change the design on the car a little bit wheels out. Got that? White tires. Good choice. Yeah, can you <laughs> pull the rims out here? I'll pull the rims out. Can you change those to black? Sure. Metallic black? Change the tires back to rubber. There you go. I'll show you some of the level of realism here. <clears throat> so if I look really close, you can see that these really have metallic uh, finishes on them. And I can get in very, very close to the, to the objects. And I'm going to have Dan sit in. Did you go inside the car yet, Dan? I did, but I'm going to. <laughs> this time I want to drive. All right. So I'm inside the car now. I'm waiting for Dan to join me. Come on in, Dan. There we go. So now we're inside the car. So imagine that you are working on your software to design your car, and you you know push the dashboard forward a little bit, or you raise the roof, or you pull the steering column or the center column back. You could get in your model and instantly see the changes and experience the changes there. One more thing. Uh, let's go over to the map, Dan and Lauren. So we've got a map here, and you can see if I look down, it's a topographical 3D map, which is very cool in itself. It's Mount Fuji. I'm going to make it smaller so we have more room. Let's see where I am. My stage is really, really small. I'm sorry, guys. There we go. But don't pull up. I know. <laughs> so that's, that's going to be a lot better. It's having a really bad experience with just that. So I'm going to make a pathway that I'm going to take up to Mount Fuji. There's my path. 
Dan's put a little block on there. You can also do things like uh, go through images. And please keep me, I, I don't know what time it is, so um, if I'm going over, I'm sorry. We need to add a clock in here. There. There's a clock over there on the other side of the room. I think we got it. But I'm having a lot of fun, so you might have to stop me. Military, here we go. Let's put some, let's put a base on here. So here's a military base. I'm gonna put that down here at the base of my thing here. And what's really cool is now, okay, two minutes. So I've got my base here and I've got my map of Mount Fuji and we see the plan. That's great, right? Everybody kind of expects that. And now I'm gonna do is jump into the map. And now I'm inside the map. Here's my base, here's my path. And keep in mind, this could be anything, right? This could be a shopping center, it could be the wharf district, uh, it could be a very large building that you're designing, anything you want. And you can go, actually go through the design that you made. I'm just gonna go up to the top of the mountain because it's really fun. And I'm up here, and now I can see the whole map. Dan's out there. Hey Dan, why don't you come down and join me here at the top of the mountain? Here comes Dan. Hi Dan. <laughs> There's Dan. So now we can review our plans. If this had been a city and we had models and little images of, you know, wharfs and banks and hotels and everything, we could look over it and walk through the streets and instantly collaborate on our design. Uh, we've got, you know, it just goes on and on and on, right? These are clear boards that you can write on. Oh, this is interesting because this shows you the history of VR. You used to have to have this big, big huge server here that you see and, and a screen and it was hard to move and uh, one of our reps had to take that huge thing all over China and he hates me for it now. And then we went to number two here, which is a little laptop and a little external graphics card. And now we're on this laptop that's right on the podium and just this headset. Um, so I think that's great. Here. That's awesome. So, um, and what that what that didn't show was when I said VR isn't necessarily about a headset experience. So one of the participants right now is participating on a laptop, it's not wearing a headset. We have a version of this product running on a mobile phone. So it's not exactly the same, but you could imagine if you're trying to train a 250 person sales force, you might have a product manager and a marketing specialist and an engineer in an immersive space showing things, but everybody's participating here, where they can ask questions, go in later, what have you. So though you're watching a demo where they're both wearing headsets because they're trying to show you the full immersive experience, it doesn't, it, it's not limited to that. And so it's a, it's a key point because when we've been out working with initial customers, they, they want to enable large groups of people, but they don't need all of them updating their computing infrastructure and all like, like transforming their work into headset-based work. Some people will, and in some use cases, it's partic particularly helpful, maybe for training somebody before they even show up for work. A analogies like that. So I think Vince, we're about out of time unless okay. you're, you're all, you covered it up? One more thing. Okay, I, I thought so. Sorry, <laughs> I switched to this big open space. This is the last thing. This big open space to show you that uh, we're really unlimited in the amount of space. We can be here collaborating and talking and Lauren wants some attention. Hi, Lauren. And uh, But I could go way outside the space and we could do things out here. You know, all the things that I showed you already, we can put up a whiteboard here. We can put up, uh, you know, uh, a web page or a live web page over here, and we can talk. And I don't need to enter anything, uh, but we can do all of our work here as a breakout session, and then we could go back and join back in with the crew and talk about the work that we did in here. So we're really unlimited in the amount of space. These worlds are all conjured up by us and by clients. Uh, they can be anything you want them to be. Uh, so it's really limitless. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Yep.